Now, the Home Secretary, James Cleverly, has arrived in Rwanda. He's there to sign a new treaty to send channel migrants and asylum seekers there. We'll see if that ever actually happens. Now, that's dealing with those who've arrived illegally in our country. It comes after the government made a major announcement yesterday to deal with those who've arrived legally getting visas from the government. They've announced new visa rules to cut net migration by three 100,000. Uh, mostly this is going to involve having a higher uh, salary threshold and not basically saying to any employer, yeah, you could just employ people at 20% below the wages if it's an area where we are really in shortage of staff. Well, I'm joined right now uh, by Jonathan Dulles. He's a Conservative MP for Stoke-on-Trent North uh, to discuss all of this. Uh, good morning to you, Jonathan. Hello, Judy. How are you? Very well, indeed. Thank you very much, indeed, for joining us. Now, um, Jonathan, you know, you're one of the Red Wall MPs who's been sort of crying out to the government to do something about this and, well, pretty much every other policy where the government is failing. From what you... Let's deal specifically with legal migrants, because we saw that, I mean, absolutely shocking figure the other week, 745,000 net migrants arriving in the country in 2022. It'll be 600,000 plus uh, for this year. That's not what people signed up to. Most people still remember the, getting the, the, net, the net migrant figure down to the tens of thousands, certainly not in the many hundreds of thousands. Do you think that what was announced by James Cleverley, the new Home Secretary, is going to work and that cutting the number of visas by 300,000 is actually going to make a difference? Well, first of all, Julie, I was delighted to see the Home Secretary make a big step forward in the right direction with yesterday's announcement, something that the new Conservatives I'm proud to have co-founded with Miriam Cates and Danny Kruger have been calling for. And some of our 12-point plan was adopted yesterday, which I think will have a positive impact, halving that disgraceful number of over 670,000 that we saw recently for the year just gone. So I think this is a step, as you say, in the right direction, but there is, of course, a need to go further. You will understand better than most, Julia, with having a fine, stoky husband oh, uh, that you have. That he I was, is on, I was he there was on Sunday. I was there on Sunday in the snow. Well, there you go. Next time, Julia, you must give a call and we can uh, take you on a tour around the patch <laughs> because, obviously, it's so important to make sure that we do deliver on that important pledge to take back control of our borders. People voted, as you know, in the Brexit capital in Stoke-on-Trent to leave the European Union. They elected for the first time ever three Conservative members of Parliament in Stoke-on-Trent in 2019 to deliver on that pledge. And if we don't show that we're serious and credible about delivering this, then essentially the city of Stoke-on-Trent, and as well as other parts of the country, will sack the Conservatives at the next election. Well, I mean, that's the thing. People have been very, very clear. Voters have been really clear. And we know even, um, you know, many Labour voters who didn't go over to, to you guys in 2019 also feel strongly about the issue, certainly of uh, illegal migration, but also just the mass numbers. We all know we don't have any housing extra. We don't have any spare school places and hospital appointments and GP appointments to get, uh, uh, to, to, to get you know, to, to give to these people who are arriving. But this is the thing. The government seems to have had this attitude where it's sort of, oh, Gosh, where, where have all these people come from? I mean, no one told us. They've literally been in charge of giving the visas out for the last few years. How did they not know how many people were here? And why were they giving visas to so many people? Basically, hoping the rest of us wouldn't notice or find out. Well, as you know, Julia, first of all, we have some of those in figures that are inflated with the fact we have Ukrainians and Hong Kongers. That's not me making an excuse, that's just a reality in the numbers. Yeah. But the reality no, and also that, and that's is a that we worthwhile introduced... thing that people support. We get that. No, absolutely. And look, we introduced, as you say, a points-based immigration system, something that I voted for. And the idea was for us to regularly monitor and make sure that that system was working in the interest of the British public. And I do agree that it's taken far too long. And that's why someone like me has been banging on for as long as I have been since being elected, that we must take action and go full throttle. And I was glad to see that the immigration minister, Robert Jenrick, clearly won the internal battle within government to actually go as far as they have done, although there is, of course, space, uh, which I think he's admitted himself on the media around this morning, to go further. And something that I would like us to see, for example, do is extend closing off dependence coming in for those on these one-year research master's degrees. Yeah. That would make around seventy five to 100,000 uh, fewer people able to come to the country, which, of course, would be good in terms of controlling migration. I think we've seen as well, as you say, with the health and social care visas, around 100,000 were for those to work in the workforce, but 120,000 went to dependents. Yeah. And only 25% of those actually work. So that puts a huge strain on our public services, as well as a huge cost yep. to the British taxpayer, which is simply not fair. Well, this is the thing. That said, though, when it comes to like, the likes of care workers and, and NHS workers, are they going to want to come and work here if they can't bring their husband or their wife or, or, or their kids? I'm going to say they probably won't. 
Well, first of all, I think obviously it's a choice that people have to make, and it is their choice to come here and abide by the rules of our country, just like we have to abide by the rules of other nations. But I think what's more important, Julia, something I know you've been calling for for a long period of time as well, is that we must invest in people here in Britain. Yeah. That means actually skilling up our own workforce, both those in their 50s who are looking maybe for a new career opportunity, as well as those younger people who actually need to see that working in a care home is actually a very valued and respected profession, rather than having this Blairism idea that everyone must become a graduate and go and work in law or even in politics, perfectly frank, Julia, because what we need is more people wanting to work in those type of jobs. And that means employers themselves improving the pay, improving the working terms and conditions. We saw this with HGV drivers, that when we saw the government improve yeah. access to testing, improve quality of training, and we saw employers improve their pay, we were able to solve the problem here at home. And well, as it's, a it's, it's amazing, of isn't it? Driving. We're constantly told when it comes to, say, the city and getting high school people, well, you have to allow them to get their bonuses, you have to allow this and that because you just won't get the brightest and the best because it's all about money. And then, bizarrely, when it comes to lower-paid jobs, funnily enough, they're not... Apparently, people aren't incentivised by money, which is bizarre because, actually, the lower the pay people are on, the more every extra pound does matter. But we've got a ridiculous situation where, in some areas of industry and uh, and uh, and commerce, people are you know private businesses are allowed to pay twenty percent below the sort of the going rate to bring in a foreign worker, whether it's you know Indian restaurant chefs and it was a big issue for a while. Other areas of hospitality, um, uh, in, in some of the sort of the, the agriculture processes. I'm sorry, what on earth is is an employer being allowed to employ someone at a low rate? Of course, because they come from abroad. Of course they're going to be incentivised to get people from abroad who aren't going to perhaps know their, their, uh, their, their employment rights and, and uh, aren't going to demand all, the, all the, the, the holiday leave and things like that, maternity leave and the like. Get them in cheap and, and then you know, we'll subsidise them with, our, with their housing benefit. We are basically subsidising profitable big businesses to make more money off the backs of cheap workers. That cannot be the basis of our economy in the 21st century. Julia, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head here, and I'm appalled that what's happened for far too long of governments of all colours over the last 20 years or so is that we've allowed business to basically dictate the rules around immigration because what we're, they're interested in is making more profit for themselves to pay out their shareholders and in dividends much more. And actually, this is what you go to the heart of it. It should be on those businesses to invest in their communities that they serve, invest in the individuals that are there, Pay their work workers a fair wage and stop relying on cheap foreign labour yeah. in order to fill these vacancies and actually do the decent thing and pay the workers fairly that you have here in your local area that in said, order to make sure that they can do a de decent job. That said also, we do also need people to get off their backsides and go to work for a living. If you're able to work, you should work. It should be considered your moral duty. It should be a matter of... Sorry, it should be a matter of stigma and shame for able-bodied, able-minded people to work. There's plenty of work from home now, plenty of work where people don't have to leave the house if they've got um, uh, mobility issues. Um, certainly young people. I'm sorry, I want work there. I, I'm, there's plenty of stuff, you know, the streets need sweeping, there's graffiti that needs removing on every train and every, uh, every uh, you know, bridge. Let's get people to work. I just don't think anybody who's, who could be in work has a right to sit around expecting other people to pay for them. And I think we're also into a parenting issue here where people are bringing up work-shy youngsters. I'd be, the thing I'd be most ashamed of is if my child didn't have a work ethic. Well, look, Julia, I was one of those, I'm sure, like you were. When I was 15, my mum told me if I wanted to get my hair cut the way I wanted, <laughs> I had to go and get a job. So I started off working in a pizza hut kitchen in Stratford upon Avon before obviously working in a in a Burton's uh, menswear store. So, you know, I it's was all, used to it's having It's all rubbed off on you. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it, it, yeah, it's important. Yeah, I got my hair cut. I had to, if I wanted my own deodorant, all these type of luxuries if I, if I wanted, I had to fund myself. My parents installed yeah. that work ethic. My grandfather that was the norm. broke lorries, not... My grandfather drove lorries over 90 hours a week to be able to buy his first home in the 1950s and he became the first homeowner in my family uh, in history. So this is the kind of work ethic that we need to see. My father was a receptionist during the day at the council whilst also doing his open university degree so he could then become a teacher himself. Yeah. You are absolutely bang on the money, Julia, that we need to have a work ethic in this country. And John, your previous caller, who I think sounded incredibly... It sounded like a Stokey from all the type of sound things that he was saying, uh, was bang on the money. That At the end of the day, it used to be about uh, shame if you didn't go to work. Yeah. And uh, even though the government has done some stuff with the recent spring budget around £7 billion to invest in trying to get over a million people back into work. What we do need to have is a much clearer system, which the Chancellor has introduced in the autumn statement, that if after a certain period of time you've not found work... It's and not 18 made any months, for God's sake. 
I mean, I'm thinking. Julia, I'm, you know I'm me, Julia. I would like weeks. that to be earlier. Julia, you know me. I like that to be earlier, but I think it's a fair compromise to at least start with, and it's a step in the right direction. Okay, you Sometimes compromise with people who who sit around on their fat backsides. I'm sorry, I just don't think you do. The compromise is I don't want to have to give you my money. I'd rather my money went to people who needed it, genuinely disabled, people who, the elderly, people, we are a civilised society. We should be looking after people who can't work. But if you don't work, yeah. but you can work, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't see what we're, I don't know why we're funding these people. I would always say they'll get a job when they're hungry enough. Um, just find it, one word, um, Rwanda, James Cleverley, third Home Secretary to go to Rwanda. Not a single channel migrant has turned up there. Do you think a single cha channel migrant will ever actually end up in Rwanda? Yes or no? Yes. 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 Yeah, we'll see. Just, I said just finally, and another just finally. Um, uh, an interesting tweet went out today, uh, yesterday um, from uh, uh, Calgi of the Express. <laughs> out, I'm, I met up with Angela Rayner quite by chance, uh, the Manchester Warehouse Project on Saturday night. Yes, if you're looking at that photo, drink had been taken on both sides. Some. Some of us have drank more than others, though, I'd like to say. Uh, not me. Uh, and then you uh, saw Angela Rayner um, only, uh, only the next day. I think she did a trip to Stoke. Uh, and apparently um, the word is that uh, she's on a, uh, a tour. She's haunting a right-winger a day from now until Christmas. I, I, I think, Julia, that what we both managed to do is uh, cause Angela issues with the, uh, with the hemp sandal wearers in the Labour Party <laughs> uh, who are now going to be spitting out their chai lattes and avocado from seeing that picture. But I'm glad to know that we get to live rent-free in so many heads. <laughs> Indeed, Jonathan Gullis, thank you very much. Indeed.